Hello, and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeffrey Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got a guest from Denmark here today for you. So we're recording a little earlier than usual. But Jesper Schmidt is going to be, we're going to be talking all about Twitter. But let me first tell you that he's the author of two novels in his Keystone Bone trilogy. He's also put out a book on fantasy map making. And his latest release is called Twitter for Authors, Save Time, Get Followers, and Grow Your Email List. And we're going to talk to him about Twitter marketing and as the book suggests, how to kind of use it to sell more books and grow your list. Hi, Jesper. Welcome to the show. Hi, Lindsay. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction there. <laughs> Do you want to tell us a little bit about how you got into writing and publishing and then also doing some nonfiction stuff? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so usually, you know, every every year here in here in the nordics uh, uh we like to go to uh, finland my um, for our summer vacation and um uh it was one of those trips a couple of years back uh where we uh, we usually go to the sauna every evening uh, which is customary there and uh, i was sitting there and i've always you know for a long long time i've been wanting to uh um, to write in the sense that uh, I was always thinking this is something I would do one day when, when I retired or something. And um, then during that evening one time uh, a couple of years back in 2015, uh, I just started to wonder why it was so that I had this idea that I should do it when I retired. <laughs> and basically from the next day I started writing away and thought, well, I'll do it now <laughs> instead. So uh, I've been doing that ever since uh, as a let's say a side activity next to my day job um, we'll see how it goes in the coming years here and uh is fantasy a pretty popular genre up there is that something you always loved yeah i i've always loved fantasy it's always what i've read it's the type of movies i like to watch and so for me it was kind of a a no-brainer that that's what i wanted to write um if it's popular specifically up here I, I don't know uh, I, I guess it's similar to the rest of the world but with indie publishing nowadays it doesn't really matter where you sit uh, you just you you can reach audience everywhere nowadays so so that's that's an awesome possibility we have now that we didn't have uh, some years back yeah and I, it's, it's really cool I feel like I've, I've heard from quite a few fans from Denmark and I don't even think there's an Amazon store there is there, is there? no no yeah. there's not so they're getting it from Smashwords, or I guess maybe, do you, can you buy from Amazon in a different country? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I usually buy my com, or I can buy it from uh, UK, the UK store if I want, but it doesn't really matter with ebooks. So I, I usually just buy mine from com. That's not a problem. Okay. And I'm curious, your books are in English, it looks like, at least on yes. Amazon.com. Yes, did they you, are. English. Did you ever think, sh which language should I do this in? Or probably you thought maybe a bigger audience in English? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Just that. Uh, I, you know, if I was to write this stuff in Danish, I think I would have a very hard time getting any significant traction with trying to sell some books. So, uh, and I, I, I don't know, I've always liked the English language anyway, so it was fine for me to, I, I just wrote in English and get a good English editor to correct all my grammar mistakes and, and then it works. <laughs> Awesome. Well, it looks like you're one of those people, which we understand, that kind of like to teach what they're learning as they're learning the marketing and publishing side of things. You've got a bunch of videos up on your website. Can you talk about why you got into that and what kind of things you're covering on there? Yeah, so, well, I'm, I'm doing kind of multiple different things. And as you said, I, I like to... I enjoy teaching. I, I enjoy sharing what I learn and, and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I'm also, I'm running a YouTube channel where basically I'm sharing inspirational videos around fantasy, world building, characters and setting kind of things um, to help people in their world building part. So I, I release a video around that and every Monday. Uh, and then I also like to kind of document my process, so to speak. So that's, for example, how Twitter for Authors came to life, uh, me documenting how uh, a lot of trial and error uh, on how to, to do that part. Um, and within the last uh, probably like four months ago, I have also teamed up with another fantasy author and we are also running a, a website called amwritingfantasy.com where we also uh, 
trying to share a lot of knowledge and or both in terms of writing but also in terms of uh, marketing tips and tricks and that sort of thing so i i do kind of, <laughs> i keep quite busy i would say <laughs> Yeah, especially if you're still working uh, full time at a, <laughs> a regular job, it sounds like. Yes, yes, that's right. So it's uh, getting up very early and uh, working late and that sort of thing. Are you finding it, it looks like you've got two novels out now about a year apart. Are you finding it challenging to keep them selling in between releases? Yeah, yeah, it's it's it is pretty difficult. And then, I don't know, you know, uh, I I I do a lot of research. I listen to also a lot of podcasts like, like this one, for example, um, about the marketing side. And I think also what I'm hearing all the time is basically that, you know, you need to build up a certain back catalog before you actually see some traction. Uh, and I'm not quite there yet. So I'm still in, in the process. Uh, I've only been writing since summer 2015. So uh, it's been, well, what is it? Four books I've out now since then. So it's, but it's about building it up. And on the fiction side, I only have the two first of the trilogy. So uh, I'm in the editing phase of book number three at the moment. So I'm I'm hoping once that book three comes out uh, and there is a full trilogy that people can get, that that will help it sell a bit more. All right, that's uh, good to know, Jeff. Sorry, I was just looking at this chat there. Uh, real quick there, I do have a, a question for you. Uh, being fantasy authors, I have to throw in a question about your book on fantasy map making that I saw in your biography. What prompted you to write a book about it? I mean, do you recommend trying to draw out your own map or let's just let a professional do it? Um, yeah, okay. So basically what I do is uh, I use uh, a piece of software called Campaign Cartographer 3, uh, which will help you kind of make your map uh, but my recommendation within the book itself is basically that i'll use that to create my initial world map but then i will give it to a professional cartographer to you know spice it up and make it look really good um, because i'm just of the opinion if you want to add a map to your book it should really look really professional and uh, campaign cartographer 3 while it's a good it's a good piece of software, but it's not going to, it's, you can't make it look that good, so to speak. Um, but essentially in terms of writing that book, it, that was more because when, when I set out to start writing my fantasy trilogy, I wanted to have a, a map in there. That, that's kind of a no brainer for me, that, that has to be a map. Um, but, uh, and, I, and I wanted it to be professional. So I, I, uh, that, that's kind of how I always go about things. So, uh, I went to Amazon actually and I started searching for books about fantasy map making and all the stuff that came up was about how to draw and I am not interested in drawing I have, <laughs> I have no skills in drawing uh, and there was not a single book about how to design your map to you know to make sure that all the you know things about tectonic plates weather patterns all the climate stuff all that good stuff there was nothing around that and and I thought okay I, I need to understand this because I want the map to be relevant for real life stuff, uh, you know, just so that it's not uh, pulling the reader out because there's something off. Um, and then I thought, if I'm going to do all that, I'm not going to do all that research just to uh, just for one off thing. So I better document it all while I'm doing it so that I can go back to it every single time in the future. And that's basically how it, it came to life, that book. All right. And actually, I have a question from one of our viewers real quick from Montgomery, Monty. He says, uh, on with regards to cartography, does it help marketing? Because apparently he's struggling with his. If it helps marketing your book, is that the yeah. question? Yeah, I, I think you know, help marketing the book if you have a map about your fantasy world. No, no, I don't think it helps in marketing the book as per, per se, but, but what it does is that it, it helps once you, uh, you know, once you have a, book, a map inside the book, it, it, in, in the map making book, I talk a lot about immersion. That's kind of a thread throughout the whole book. And it just adds a lot of immersion for the readers and it grounds them in the fantasy setting and they can much better orientate themselves within the, um, in the map there uh, or the or the trilogy as well so but i don't know it's not a marketing trick so to speak come on down we got the coolest map ever and therefore you should buy this book yeah <laughs> I, I will say i haven't really done the map thing i had one person offer to do it once and i paid them a little bit and she did it and it was great but readers will 
they do not like it if you don't have maps if you're making no. up the world and so I, I it's something i would love to do one day it just hasn't been a priority plus you can't like charge more money because you spent a thousand dollars getting someone to draw you a professional hmm. map but for those who no. have the resources go ahead no, no, but, no, but that's just on on the money part there. I mean, in in the I have a one of the chapters in the book. I'm actually, I mean, I spent quite some money on maps because I wanted to show what different levels of cost would look like. So inside the book, I have a few different versions of the same map, but developed by different cartographers at different price levels. So you can actually get a feeling about what are you going to get and how much money you're spending, and it it doesn't have to cost that much money. Uh, I mean, you you can get pretty decent looking maps for maybe fifty dollars, and then you can go up to kind of the high end. The, the most high end one I added to the book was uh, I think it's three hundred or four hundred dollars, which is completely hand drawn everything, and it looks amazing. And of course, there's a difference between fifty dollars and three hundred dollars. But even that said, it, it's it's not going to completely break the bank. I mean, you, you can go with a $50 one and have it look good and add it to the book. That That's that's possible. Yeah, I guess the other thing, too, is time, because that's probably more for me where I thought I'd have to actually go through my eight books and figure out where everything is located to make sure I'm not contradicting myself. Do you do it, like, at the beginning before you even start writing when you do yours? Yes, correct. Correct. Yes, yeah, I do it first. That would yeah. be the smart way to do it. Yes. <laughs> All right, cool. We'll put a link to the map making book also in the show notes. So if people want to check that out, uh, we are yep. going to segue to Twitter stuff since that's something we've talked a little bit about on the show, but we've never done one just dedicated on how you can actually use Twitter to, you know, grow your list or maybe possibly sell books. I guess we'll ask you if you're, what kind of luck you're having on there. Um, I feel like, you know, I've been on there for years and I've met some authors and interacted with fans that way, but I, I, other than a new release that people are waiting for, I don't know that I've managed to sell a whole lot of books through Twitter. So what has your experience been? Well, I think in terms of, uh, you know, how you are viewing Twitter, um, you, I mean, if, if you, if we take an example for you, let, let's say you are, you're following a hundred people and each of those people sends, let's say five tweets a day. That's 500 tweets appearing in your Twitter feed every day. And then you can of course scale it up and, and then quite easily imagine how many of those tweets are you actually going to read or even see. And that's not going to be many. Um, and basically because of this whole way of Twitter's working and it's basically bombarding you with, with tweets all the time. It is really not a trusted sales partner per se. So it's it's not something that you're going to use and then all of a sudden you are going to sell a ton of books based on it. I mean, I, I have close to 40,000 followers on Twitter, but it's not that that in itself sells the books. But the way you need to see it is that Twitter can lead to sales because what Twitter can do probably better than most of any other marketing tools that you have available is building those one-to-one -one connections with people. Uh, it is really a strong powerhouse in doing that. Uh, Twitter puts almost no obstacles in your way in terms of reaching people, in connecting with people. Um, opposite Facebook, for example, you don't even have to pay to reach your own followers. Um, you, of course, have to have some thinking behind uh, the fact that you are that you do need to tweet uh, more often and on Twitter it's not a deadly sin to tweet the same thing uh, several times as long as it doesn't happen you know within one or two hours all the time but if you kind of spread it out and if you use some systems like I do to uh, to to both schedule your tweets but also um, one of the tools I'm using have have this way where you can actually write in, um, several different text versions of the same tweet. So once it gets to that tweet in the cycle, it will pick another, uh, let's say, wording for the tweet. So for followers, when you have a if, when you have a lot of stuff in these queues, it'll probably take weeks before it recycles. And when it does recycle, it'll be new text coming for each of the tweets again. So basically, it keeps the whole feed very fresh and it does not look at all like it's repeating stuff, even though to some extent it is. Yeah, I used to do it a little more like that uh, when I was doing blog posts. And so I kind of had some free information for people. I'd actually go through the effort of 
basically tweeting the same thing, but saying it a little different. And, you know, that's a good point that Twitter is very much like in the moment. So if you tweet something different four hours later, a whole different group of people are probably going to see it. Yeah, and also that the time zone thing plays in here as well. Uh, so that, uh, you know, tweeting something uh, at eight morning your time and then eight evening your uh, your time again, well, will, will, it'll reach a different audience by then. Um, so, uh, so, so you, yeah, you, but, but the thing, at the end of the day, the thing is you need to make sure that the content you are tweeting is fresh. It is um, interesting for the specific audience you're trying to reach. So, uh, for example, since uh, we are fantasy authors, he, authors here, it wouldn't make much sense if we started tweeting about thriller books or something like that or whatever. Uh, I mean, you know, you, you need to keep it aligned with the brand that you're trying to build. And um, actually, I have a I added the whole chapter in the beginning of, of the of the Twitter for authors book as well about things that you need to think about when when you're even setting up your Twitter account, you know, what kind of uh, pictures you're using, what kind of uh, text you're writing in your bio, to, to, you know, so that it links to the brand that you're building for yourself, because this is basically going to turn into a professional tool that forms a part of your marketing engine and part of your business. It's not like something you should just be using for, you know, checking whatever your famous celebrity or personal favorite celebrity got for for breakfast this morning or something. You know, those those days are over if you want to use it for for marketing and business related things. So in other words, don't do what I did in 2009 and put Goblin Writer for your uh, Twitter handle, <laughs> especially if you're only going to write a few stories with goblins and then move on to other things. The, the time I wasn't publishing anything so I was just stalking agents <laughs> right yeah <laughs> all right let me slip in a question from Lon from Twitter <laughs> you kind of already answered this but he was asking is it a viable option or are you just screaming into the void yeah well the, the thing is that where you know I want to draw a parallel probably to the music industry here because if it, they, they are usually like a couple of years ahead of us in, in when it comes to uh, publishing and uh, if we go back to probably like 2004-ish I would say um, the same kind of thing happened in the music industry that then happened to us like four years later 2008 around there uh, so uh, people was all of a sudden able to uh, record their own music and release that um, uh, from home which not necessarily went uh, made the quality poorer but it just flooded the market with a lot of stuff and that's kind of where we are today as well so in terms of screaming into the void as, as asked there uh, you know what you need to do is you need to make sure that the people you are tweeting at are your target audience so if you're just tweeting to whomever shows up uh, then the level of um, let's say engagement you get and the, the level of valuable insight from the, from the audience is, is going to be very little. So, so basically what you need to do is try to make sure that you're building the Twitter following of your target audience. Um, and the way you are doing that, for example, uh, I, I use a, a piece of co uh, software called Crowdfire to do that. Uh, and basically Crowdfire will allow you to, for example, I could, I could type in, for example, one of you guys, and then Crowdfire would show me inside the, inside the software all of your followers and then what i could do would i could then assume that uh, since you are all fantasy authors i could assume that well your audience are probably people who like the stuff about fantasy um and then what i will do using this piece of software is that i'll start following those people because as well this is not a secret but probably as everybody most people will know who use twitter for a while is that the unsaid rule on twitter is that when somebody follows you most people will follow you back so by that i'm just getting a follower who actually has an interest in fantasy and then once i have them then i need to make sure that i'm tweeting stuff at them that are relevant as i said before and interesting to a fantasy audience because otherwise if they're starting to see all kinds of strange stuff that, that has no interest to them in in the twitter feed for me then they will basically stop interacting with the tweets and twitter does have an algorithm sitting behind so it will 
to some degree decide what to show you and what not to show you based on what you have previously liked or replied to and that sort of, or retweeted and that sort of thing. So if you make sure that the stuff you are tweeting are relevant, then people will like it, they will engage with it. And the more they do that, the more of your stuff they will see. So, so, so it's kind of a long-term game plan, so to speak, you know, it's it's not going to happen from day to day and all of a sudden you're going to uh, sell a ton of books. That's not how it works. Uh, you, you need to work up on it over time, uh, which is also a part of why I'm saying in the book that, you know, don't, don't take up Twitter if it's because you think you're going to sell a lot of books. You know, you, you, you need to like the platform in the first place. You need to like the type of engagement you're getting on Twitter because otherwise you are going to grow really tired really fast. <laughs> Uh, which sort of brings me to my question. Uh, like, obviously, you know, it's intelligent to be tweeting things that are relevant to your audience, uh, but it seems like a lot of authors on Twitter uh, and just content creators in general on Twitter use it exclusively for their content, and there's very little personal uh, usage in the way that most of the audience are using it for. So should you avoid being too casual, or can there be some standard Twitter usage mixed in? Yeah, well, what, what I do is, um, so I have, uh, well, I have this whole system built up with different kind of uh, feeds going out from the, the, the tool I'm using for that stuff is called Social Oomph, uh, where you can set up kinds of different feeds with, with all kinds of different stuff. So I have, um, because, for example, as I said before, because I'm running a YouTube channel, I have weekly new content coming uh, with a new video every week. So there's a queue sitting in there that will post uh, frequently around the content pieces, as you said there. But I also have set up another, a few other cues. So one of them is, is like funny stuff. So there'll be funny stuff in there that goes out once, uh, once a day as well. Uh, a new kind of joke or funny thing or whatever. I have another one where it's inspirational stuff uh, because I like to share that sort of thing. I, uh, so one of those goes out once a day as well. Um, then on the side, once a week, I sit down and then I manually schedule a whole next week worth of tweets and all of those are personal more kind of tweets so that'll be maybe a status on status on where i am writing something or something that just happened in in my life or whatever but uh, but i just you know condense all of that scheduling to one morning every saturday morning i sit down and do the next week so that I'm, i don't really have to spend much time managing twitter on a weekly basis at all uh, so it all I have to do on a daily basis is then because people will start responding, they will start uh, interacting with you. So, so I have a rule with myself <laughs> and I try to uh, govern the same in the book that uh, if somebody tweets at you within 24 hours, you have to reply to them uh, or at least some way or another acknowledge them unless it's a, it's a troll or something, you, then you ignore them. <laughs> but otherwise, y you should do that because people need to see that you are actually using the platform. It's not like an automated system that is just sitting there pumping stuff into the void. Um, so, um, so so, I have kind of a combination. So I, have, I do have like evergreen content stuff that goes out, but I also have these manual, uh, more personal, uh, but I keep those um either link to some of my writing for example uh it, it can be also stuff where i share a new book cover or whatever um once in a while i do share something kind of more on the personal side but uh i'm, I'm not venturing too far into that space so so it, it's a combination yeah <clears throat> okay so <laughs> for those authors who don't use twitter and who won't touch it with a 10-foot pole, even if they, and they don't plan the change, answer me this. What is the appeal? I mean, you're limited in size of the messages you can send, which typically means the message is so shortened and abbreviated, it's practically a foreign language. Why do you like it so much? Because <laughs> hey, you know I'm right. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I've l listened to this podcast for quite a while, so I know you don't like Twitter, so, so I, I know I'm, I'm in for an uphill battle here. <laughs> no, it's just me, though. I am the odd one out here. Everyone else uses it, and I, people in the, the live chat are like, come on, man, you know, Twitter's great. I'm like, mm, fighting a tooth and nail. So I, I want to hear your answer. Like, what's so great about it? Yeah, well, uh, okay, so Twitter is really great in the sense that it um, – it is a very, very impersonal um, platform in the sense that, you know, you can bounce back and forth with people. It, it's kind of like, uh, I think I used the, the 
the, the terminology of a, a big cocktail party in the book. You know, it is like a big cocktail party. You can go around, you can talk to whoever you want to do, uh, you want to talk to, and there's nothing wrong with that. that. That's kind of just the nature of the platform. That's what you do. So you can talk to anybody who tweets anything that you find interesting. And it, it, it is, that's why I'm saying that it is a powerhouse for those one-to-one -one connections. Because once you see, for example, uh, I usually pay attention to those who, for example, tweets about fantasy maps. And usually I will, if they share, often people will share pictures. So I'll comment on the pictures and say, this is re a really cool map. Thanks for sharing, you know, that, and that, that kind of way you, you will start building connections with people. Uh, some of them will stick around and they'll, then they'll start uh, commenting on some of your stuff next week. And then you, over time, you are building this informal connection with people that, that very, it's almost impossible to do on most other platforms. So fa Facebook, you can't, you can set up a, a Facebook group if you want to manage that, of course, that's, that's a, po a possibility, but then you have to get people to sign in there. Whereas on Twitter, uh, getting that audience set up uh, is it's much, much easier because you can basically just follow whoever you want. And as I said that, you know, Twitter does, does not put any uh, roadblocks in your way. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the, where the real value lies is to try to get those people onto your email list, because that's where you can really deepen the relationship with the people. Uh, it, it, it's great to have them on Twitter and you can have a lot of these informal chats and conversations. Uh, and if you can then channel them into your email list and then that's where you can build the long-term customer perspective with people as well. I am a fan of Twitter, obviously, uh, unlike Jeff, and I feel like I've built better relationships on Twitter than I have on Facebook. Uh, like you were saying, you can tweet to anybody, like your favorite author that is never going to accept your friend request on Facebook, yeah. They're gonna be like, as if, but you know, they'll probably <laughs> answer you on Twitter. It, it's it's interesting, It is, and it's like you're directly talking to them, and they're not just tagging them in some other message that you're not you know i don't hate facebook totally but, uh, <laughs> but it's different there are different things you can do in it and i think it's a you know in addition to finding readers uh finding other authors in your genre you know maybe somebody else who's just kind of like where you are or just a little above and might be open to doing some networking things together so i agree yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> But uh, let me ask you what you're doing to kind of, you mentioned getting them on your list. Are you giving away like free short stories on your blog or free novels if they sign up for your list? Um, yeah, so basically, well, that there is two ways uh, of doing it um, on, on, okay, maybe a third way. If, if you're giving away like a freebies related to your content, that's a third way, but, but that's not everybody who has that. But there's two fundamental ways that basically everybody could use. Um, the, the first one I'll mention is probably the best known one. And then the second one is much less known. Um, but the first one is, is basically your pinned tweet. So, uh, you know, that, that's simple stuff. Uh, you, you tweet uh, ordinary tweet, making sure that within that tweet, there is a link where somebody can go and download whatever you want to give away. Uh, but you need something to intensify them to actually want to deliver their email address to get something. So, you, so that, that's kind of the transaction. I'm giving you something and you're giving me your email address in return. So that you have to have. So you need to have something. Uh, for my Twin Pete, for example, I'm uh, a tweet I'm using a uh, behind the scenes document. So I have like, it's like a four page PDF with a character that I, that I ended up editing completely out of the book. So he doesn't exist in the book, but I liked his storyline. So I transferred it into, you know, I created like a four page PDF of that, explaining the storyline and what, what I wanted to do with the character and so forth. Uh, and then I have that sitting um, as a download uh, option uh, with a link. And then you basically send out your tweet with that link in it, and then you inside Twitter you can just uh, you can just click click on on that uh, tweet and then ask it to be pinned. So once once you do that, it'll sit on top of your uh, Twitter feed inside your profile. So whenever somebody clicks on your profile, that's the first tweet they'll see every time. So that that's basic stuff, and I think most people know that stuff. Um, and because of this whole using Crowdfire to follow people who learn for no follow you back, it is quite ordinary. And most people will, before they follow somebody back, they will usually click on your profile just to check what it is. So, and that's, and then they see your pinned tweet. Uh, and then 
I get about 8% sign up from that, you know, versus those who clicks about 8% uh, into my profile, but about 8% of them will sign up. So, so that, that's pretty good for something that just sits there without you really touching it. It's, it's all automated. There's no effort for me at all. So, so that's the, let's say, most common one. Uh, the much less common one, uh, and, uh, and I have a whole chapter in the book explaining how to do this stuff. Uh, so since audio, here, audio might not be the best way, but I'll try to explain it nevertheless. Um, when you, if you go to the Twitter ads platform and basically tweet, uh, oh, sorry, um, trick Twitter, to think that you're gonna advertise with them, meaning that you're gonna put in your credit card information, just like if you were gonna advertise. So you're not gonna spend any money, but you're gonna make Twitter think you are. Uh, so once you put in your uh, credit card information, you will get access to the ads platform that sits behind where you can do all kinds of stuff, but you're only interested in one single thing in there. And that's something called a Twitter card. Um, and the Twitter card sits inside the the ads platform, so you can't get there unless you know this kind of uh, trick. <laughs> There's nowhere else you can you can get access to it. So you go in there, and the Twitter card is basically like you create an image uh, that you upload to the Twitter card. So uh, asking Twitter, you need to use this image, uh, and then you write some text for it. Uh, and what then? Uh, and that text could, for example, be in my case, I'm giving. Uh, the first book in my series away for free, but I only give it away f to new followers. I'm not giving it a, it, it, it uh, as a perma free on uh, uh, on Amazon, for example. So I'm basically adding a text saying, uh, you know, thank you for your following as an exclusive. Thank you. Here is a link where you can get my first book for free. Uh, and then you set all that up inside the ads platform. And what once you've done all of that, it will give you a unique URL, uh, like a Twitter URL. And that URL is the one you're going to take. And then every time somebody new follows you, you're going to tweet them that URL. What happens then is basically that the tweet that they're going to get is going to appear in their mentions stream. So not in the normal you know, Twitter feed where there's tons of stuff. It'll, it'll appear as a mention in their own feed and most almost everybody checks their mentions once in a while. So people will see it, but it doesn't just appear as a normal, let, let's say a text and then whatever image you make, but it appears as, as an, a whole image where you can click anywhere you want on that image and it'll take you to the sign up. So it, it really sticks out in that mention feed because almost no, nobody uses it. And it distinguishes itself in the look and feel from all the other tweets. So, um, so it, it's a really good way of creating uh, or giving people a thank you, of course, but also getting them to um, to sign up. Uh, so basically, of course, to get the uh, link where they can download the book, which I've also set up with Book Funnel, so that happens completely automatically as well. All I need to do is to send them the here's your you know exclusive thank you tweet I need and nowadays I need to do that manually because uh, just like a month ago um, Twitter updated all the terms of service a month ago I had everything set up so it happened automatically so like one second after you followed me you would get that tweet automatically with the download link uh, but since they updated terms of service you're not no longer allowed to do that so I have to do it manually so okay I, I spent like five minutes a day and then I'll just do tweet everybody who followed me within the last 24 hours uh, so I'll do that once a day spending five minutes um, that's a bit annoying and and of course they changed the terms of service like two days after I released the book and uh, so actually in the book it's describing the automated version but I've also added a, a, you know, your daily checklist to the book. And within the daily checklist, I've specified what you need to do instead. So, so you're all covered, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, there you have it. That's use, that's how it works, right? As soon as you release something, then it changes the, <laughs> then change the rules. Yeah. This is the reason that I would be daunted at writing nonfiction books about the, any of the self-publishing marketing, Amazon ads, Facebook ads, they, they change that stuff so much. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been the recipient of that kind of thing before with that, uh, except it was direct messages. And it seems like it doesn't happen as often anymore, maybe because I don't follow anyone <laughs> anymore unless they follow me and talk to me. But, uh, and I found it a little, oh, this person just wants me to buy their book. But of course I'm an author, not necessarily just a, a reader. So have you got any, any backlash from that? And it, if it's a mention and not a direct message, to me, it sounds like it would be less intrusive. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, so so there there is huge differences in this. I mean, the the um, the direct direct messages uh, actually that that kind of got cleaned up now with the new terms of service as well. Uh, but if we just scroll back like four weeks, your direct mentions would be uh, or direct messages. I meant to say sorry, would be just filled with stupid stuff. <laughs> it would be spam upon spam upon spam which i think well it that is for sure also why they changed the terms of service so they basically shut down everything that ha that sends stuff automatically like that they, they don't that they don't allow it anymore and if you check your direct messages nowadays you will see much much less appearing than what they used to um but uh, most people don't check direct messages most of the time uh, also, because the, the, it has always been filled with this stuff, uh, spam stuff, uh, whereas the ad mention is, well, yeah, I guess it depends on how you look at it. You know, some people could feel like, well, that's annoying. I followed this person and now they're tweeting me. Well, OK, but if you're annoyed about me offering you a free book, then you're free to unfollow. Then you're definitely not my audience anyway. Um, but, uh, but I do get uh, tweets almost every day you know people replying to the ad uh, reply message with the twitter card saying thank you that that's awesome um and i don't know how often you get that for example if you are advertising free books on facebook for example that people actually tell you oh that's awesome uh, because and because you need to remember that the, the tweet that they're seeing really stands out you know it, it looks different from from the ordinary uh, tweet so 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 it has I guess it has a bit of exclusivity to it anyway, um, but uh, but I, I don't. I've never received any backlash. You know, of course, some people some will just ignore it. They'll never sign. Not not everybody will sign up. Far from it, um, but some will, and some will even take the time to to thank me. So um, so that's good. And those those who don't sign up, that's fine. You know, that is up to them. Yeah, and I always have to, as I say on here, remind myself I'm not my audience. I'm an author trying to sell stuff and get bombarded, bombarded by other authors trying to sell stuff. Whereas a reader, you may be like one of three authors they follow, and it's really exciting to them to, to get an offer, especially for something free. Like, I think it's a little different than if you're like, here's my $5 book, please buy it. But if yeah, you're that's just not offering, yeah, if you're that's just offering cool. something free, it seems like a good idea. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it is, you know, human nature is that we buy stuff from people we trust. That, that's how we work as humans. And that's why your number one game plan here is to get them onto your email list, because once you have them there, you can start building a relationship with these people. And uh, of course, on your email list, you should not bombard them with emails about buy this book, buy that book. You know, that, that's not the point either. On the email list, I'll share a lot more personal stuff. I'll talk to them like I was writing emails to a friend and basically develop relationship. And then over time, some of those people will then go on to start buying the books and some of them won't that's fine up to them again but um but but that is over time how you are gonna generate some sales and that's why i'm saying that it's it's not twitter's not like a sales partner but it can lead to sales but it takes again it takes an investment it takes the time to put into it and it, it you have to do it because you want to engage with these people Otherwise, you, I think, first of all, you're going to come across as somebody who's just doing it because you want to market something. That's not going to work. And, uh, and secondly, you're going to grow, grow tired of it yourself if, if you don't have your heart in it anyway. Right. And I'm curious, you mentioned signing up for the advertising account, but not actually advertising. Have you tried the ads? Because I tried once and blew $100 like nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nothing happens from it now. No, but I, I think that Twitter, I think that Twitter is using their ads as, you know, they are geared towards large corporations and stuff like that. Uh, and as, as authors who are selling like one or two, three, four dollar books a piece, I, I I have not managed to get any success from it. I never heard of anybody either having success with that. So I, I I would steer away from that. There's no way to to burn money on that. All right. So if we're mostly rel uh, relying on the uh, the free aspects of Twitter, um, is it worth? I mean, should people be seeking to actively grow their their follower count? And like, sh for example, should they be running promos specifically to get Twitter followers? No, I, I'm not running promos, so to speak. But wh what I do uh, every day is that I do go in and I follow 400 new people every day. Uh, and some of those people will follow me back. Uh, and uh, as I said before, then most of those people will go to my profile to check who, are, who, are, who is this guy who just followed me. They'll see my pinned tweet on the top. 
Within 24 hours, they'll also get my uh, free book offer. Uh, here's your free book. So because I'm cycling through 400 every day, and a, few, a number of those will end up going to my email list. And basically, that's where that's where I want them to go. Um, so if you're not doing anything in terms of following new people or trying to make people come to you and, and you know, basically allow you to to send these um, these welcome tweets and so forth, then um, it, it's going to be hard. I mean, you, you can grow it over time, but but just organically without you actively doing something, it's it's going to be hard. Just as like any other social media platform, you, you have to be active on it and actually try to do something. Otherwise, you're not going to get anything, I guess. With regards to your Twitter followers, I always hear everyone talking about how do you gain followers, to gain supporters, and whatnot. Can you give us any advice on what not to do when trying to get followers? What not to do when trying to get followers? Well, um, I mean, I, I, I've dedicated a part of the book as well where I'm trying to make you, or I, I'm giving you some pointers on how you can best spot like a, a, spam accounts or you know that that sort of thing there's also a surprisingly amount of uh, pornographic stuff on twitter i've all i'm always surprised on how much stuff there is of that but there's quite a lot so uh, so i have uh, and and it, they are not but once you get used to it for so for example every day once i'm in, inside crowdfire and i'm following these new people um once you get into it you can you get a pretty keen developed eye to spot those accounts just from the you know uh, crowdfire will give you the the first lines of their profile before you, before and then you can click or you cannot click to follow them and just out of those few lines i can usually spot 90 percent of them if if this is just kind of a spam account or not uh, so so you'll have some some clear let's say giveaway giveaways that that tells you that this is uh, not good so for example you uh, just on top of my head here so um accounts where their profile text is like a, a quote or something that's not normal and usually it's because they are opening hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of accounts at the same time and they don't bother writing a, want anything so they'll just stop in a quote or sometimes there's a completely blank bio that's that's a no-go either uh, and you also see these uh, where it actually looks like the bio, bio is okay you know there, there's actual text there but you'll have a picture of a extremely attractive woman <laughs> which is usually a no-go uh, because as, as soon as you click on a profile and you see what it's tweeting then you will have your cue you will see what it is <laughs> and usually i'm right when i spot those uh, and you you can see you know oh completely over glamorified uh, picture um it's not that it has to show anything it, it, sometimes it's just a face you know it's not like they're showing private parts or something like that but but it's just it's just so obvious sometimes so those things i would never follow. i try to avoid following them because at the end of the day it's just a waste of time and they're never going to download my book they're never going to be interested in what i'm what i'm about uh, so just avoid that stuff but even if you ended up following some of them if you ended up following a bot or something you know it, it's it, nothing is going to happen from it is the you just when, once you discover it, you just either unfollow again or ignore them or whatever you do. It doesn't really matter too much. So to sum up, there are no really hot, attractive people on Twitter. So don't be fooled <laughs> if you see them. There probably are, but but no. yeah. yeah, some of them are still models way on too there. obvious. Yeah, if you, if you see, apparently if you see a lady, uh, a picture of a lady that you're thinking in the event of a water landing, she can be used as a flotation device. Pass on it, huh? <laughs> Probably not a fantasy fan at the very least. <laughs> no, I think the best people for me are like, because the ones you know are readers, are pro usually the people that don't have 5,000 followers and 5,000 people they follow. A lot yeah. of times they're the ones that just have like 76 people that they're following, you know, and they're just choosing to follow only the people they're really interested in. So I think those are really good people to, you know, if maybe you tweet your book link to and, and they check it out and, uh, it sounds like that crowdfire thing. I'm going to check that out. That you mentioned would be a good way to find those people. Yes, exactly. And 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 actually, you can see it is it is also over time. You, it'll also become quite obvious to you that um, some authors are having a much more healthy following than others. Meaning that once you start following the followers of one author, and then they they will start following you back. You will see that some some of them you'll have very little engagement from their followers, uh, which is probably hinting at that their followers is filled with spam accounts or bots or whatever, you know, that 
they haven't really thought about how they're gaining those followers, whereas other authors are having a very healthy uh, community. So once you start following them, you, you'll see that their, their followers, meaning readers, will actually in, interact with you, that those are also the people who thank you for the free book and stuff like that. And there is, uh, there is huge differences. So if you're starting following the followers of one author and you're basically getting not, nothing from it, then just ditch that one and find another author and, and follow those instead because there is big differences and it varies a lot. Uh, so it just it's just part of the game. All right, got a question from Sarah here. Uh, you talked a little bit about doing like Saturday morning tweets and stuff, but uh, she was asking, do you have a Twitter schedule? What does it look like and how much time do you spend on it per day or per week? Right. Yeah. So, uh, well, I, as as we covered in the beginning, I'm just as busy as everybody else. So I, I don't want to spend a ton of time every day or every week on Twitter. Um, I use the social oomph uh, tool that I mentioned before to basically, I'm tweeting 20 times in, within every 24 hours cycle. I, I found that a reasonable level that covers all the different time zones and it's not too much. Uh, also because I have this uh, this tool can help me uh, change the text around. So, and because my queues are pretty, pretty full of stuff, uh, so it'll take a qu quite a while to go through the queues be before it turns over and starts over again. Um, so, I'm tweeting 20 hours a day. Oh, sorry, 20 times in every 24 hours. Um, and uh, out of those 20 tweets, 18 of those comes from the queue. Uh, or these different queues, and those diff and and the power of social oomph is also you can tell that to this queue you need to post from every second hour. This queue only post like every two days or whatever you want to do. You you can you're completely up to you how you want to set it up. Um, but that's 18 out of the 20. And then as I said, every Saturday morning I'll sit down and schedule one morning tweet, one evening tweet for the next week. So that's the two last one coming up to the 20. Uh, and those two will be personal stuff. As I said, it'll be, it, it'll, it's also a lot of the time, it's just me commenting on other people's tweets that I find interesting. Uh, and thus once, let's say on a Saturday, I'll schedule this reply to this tweet should go out on Monday and then it does so. And then on Monday, this author will probably start or, or reader will st probably start coming in back. And then, you know, every week you'll have a certain amount of people that you are engaging with or interacting with uh, as the days go by. Um, but I do make a promise uh, in the book that you're not gonna spend more than 30 minutes a day on Twitter and I'm not spending more than that. Um, and not even that on a daily basis. Uh, you know, on, on the weekdays, I probably spend 10, 15 minutes. And then the, in the weekend, I spent one and a half hour because I'm scheduling all next weeks of tweets. So, but spread out over a week, I'm never using more than 30 minutes a day on, on managing Twitter. Um, so so it, it's definitely manageable. All right, that sounds great. I, I, I feel like I should be doing some of this. <laughs> you know, I, what I, how I use it now is uh, I basically, if I do a typo or something funny that I'm writing, I share it because I know some of my you know, I already have readers that are following Monday. I'm not necessarily trying to get more. I mean, of course, there's nothing wrong with getting more. Because like you mentioned, I have my free book and my pinned tweet. So I want people to check out my profile. So I'll have to think about it. I know uh, jo Joanna Penn was like, you don't schedule your tweets? What's wrong with you? <laughs> so <laughs> I'll have to maybe try to do some of that. It's a great point that people are on in different time zones. And uh you know, if you just if I'm just tweeting during the day, American Workday, I'm I'm missing out on Australian and European audiences. Yeah, and and, and most people won't see it if, if you don't do that sort of thing. Uh, and you know, and and at the end of the day, it, it's I mean, me maybe it works for some, I can't say, but at least for me, if I have to sit down and every day, you know, I need okay, now I need to come up with something to tweet. It's gonna be a drag. You know, that's really hard for me. I, it it works much better once I once I sit down. Uh, this every Saturday morning, uh, basically, I go into Hootsuite. Uh, I also have all that stuff described in the book, and I even, I actually even with each chapter in the book, I actually have recorded tutorial videos. So for those who like to watch on screen, screen sharing what I'm doing, they can see that uh, where uh, and other people like to read. So it's up to people themselves. But uh, but actually, I go into Hootsuite and I have a video also showing. Uh, how I'm setting up all my different cues in, in uh, Hootsuite that are relevant to a fantasy audience. 
Uh, and basically what I need to do every Saturday morning then is that uh, I have kind of a, a small uh, checklist for myself that I go through first. So it could be something like, hey, how far have I gotten with writing? Okay, I schedule one tweet about that. Um, something funny that happened this week. Okay, I schedule one, and, you know, I had like four or five different things that I kind of go through. But then for the rest of that, uh, that those week worth of tweets is basically going through these, um, these who tweet cues to see, okay, is there something interesting in this queue? And, and Hootsuite is amazing, and it's a completely free tool, and it's amazing at that. It, it, it will real-time populate, but you basically just scroll down through the feed. I, I probably scrolled several days back worth of seeing, okay, is there something here that is interesting? For example, one of my queues is, of course, fantasy maps. So I usually scroll through that one and see if there's some cool maps coming up. And if there is, then I will schedule the tweet with a reply uh, to or, or retweet of that tweet, uh, adding my own comments to, to that map picture for example that's just an example uh, i have like i think 15 20 different queues uh, set, set up in, inside hootsuite so i can easily schedule a week's worth of tweets based on those 20 queues and because i schedule one morning and one evening uh, i also covering different uh, time zones those two two tweets are not the same though so the, the, the manual ones are all of them are different they're, they're never the same um but uh, with all this stuff setting up my manual tweets and 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 the uh, social oomph uh, cues posting out uh, you know i'm i'm constantly present on twitter even if i'm sleeping so so all i need to do when I, once i wake up is basically uh, making sure to reply to those who tweeted me uh, during the night for example or something but but because i'm also holding a day job i usually just do go about it so that whenever i you know i have a short break uh, if i'm waiting for the bus to come or, or the train or something uh, you know I'll, I'll just reply to those uh, it does not take long on a daily basis as i said probably like 15 minutes a day is all i'm spending all right very cool and one more question for me like you mentioned that kind of a new engager or new follower is going to see your profile page probably and uh the card you mentioned that sends an auto or almost automatic tweet <laughs> with your link. How are you putting uh, like in your regular feed, like are you still putting in messages that like a quote or something from your book that then links to your book or, or is it mostly just you're trying to be interesting and then hoping people will check out your profile? Yeah, so <clears throat> so I operate with this kind of uh, one to 10 rule. So so uh, out of the those queue, they'll there will be one, uh, no, I think two, if I remember correctly, uh, on top of my head here. There will be two tweets out of the 20 that are, you know, sales tweets, so to speak. So, but there's only two out of 20. Um, so, and, and those will be not by my book tweets, but for example, just as you said there, it'll be a quote from the book that um, readers have pointed out. Usually what I do as part of my launch process, once, I, I, once I'm engaging with my uh, beta readers, I usually ask them to tell me what, what kind of sentences within the book that they like the most, and they'll usually give me some. And then I'll, I'll add those to a picture uh, of the book cover as well. Uh, and then I will add that into the promotion queue inside Social Oomph which is set up to only post twice uh, every 24 hours. Um, so so with among all these 20 tweets, uh, two of them will be stuff where, with a link, of course, to where you can buy the book, uh, basically back to my website where you can get it. Uh, but, um, but yeah, so the, I don't think that there's nothing wrong in once out of 10 tweets is a sales tweet, so to speak, but don't don't make it a buy my book tweet. That's just horrible. <laughs> I see way too many of those and I, I doubt nobody has ever bought a book from, from a please buy my book tweet. Yeah, it seems like that's the, the, that is the, uh, the cliche for bad advertising, particularly on Twitter. <laughs> Um, all right, so I've seen some authors do some interesting stuff, not just authors, but like where there will be a Twitter account that is as though it is from a character. Like this is, I've seen this be very popular with like films, like Deadpool will, will, will have a Twitter presence. What are your thoughts on that sort of thing? Do they have any value in this uh, context? Uh, well, it's not something I've tried, uh, I have to say, but my thoughts on it would be that, I mean, if you have... If you have, if you're like George R. R. Martin or, or Rowling or something, and you have like a huge best-selling uh, series that uh, everybody just loves, then I can see that that would work. Uh, I, I can see having one of the Game of Thrones characters having their own account. I actually, I think they have, to be honest. Uh, but uh, to drive, you know, 
engagement with fans and stuff like that. I can see that work, but uh, that said, at the stage where that would work, you're probably already selling so many books that you don't really, you, you know, you're doing it as a fan service then. It's not going to be a marketing ploy as such. I, I don't think that, yeah, but I never tried, but, uh, but it's probably more like fan management rather than anything else. <clears throat> so being the only non-Twitter user here, I want to ask this. If someone, not me, someone wanted to jump into the Twitter world at this point in time and they were just now publishing their first book, what advice would you give them? No, but, uh, you know, when I started out uh, my Twitter, I, I, I have been on Twitter since 2012 and for the first many, uh, that, that's even three years before I started writing and I, I was using it as a cre recreational tool um, and that's all fine. And then once I started writing, I, I need, I had, you know, I need to find out how this stuff is working and how I can benefit from it. And I went through a ton of trial and error and tried all kinds of different tactics to try to get it to work. Um, until I arrived at the system that I documented in the book itself. But but it's just to, to say that actually before I released my first book, I had already amassed 6,000 followers. Um, so you can certainly do that, that there is absolutely no, nothing wrong in building your platform and building your audience uh, before you actually have a book out. Um, but it is definitely a benefit when you have some kind of content that you can share on a regular basis like a blog or in my case YouTube videos or whatever it is um, that is definitely a benefit because you can keep your feed more active and of course the more of that stuff you have uh, I started recording uh, YouTube videos way before I, I uh, had my book released I uh, also so I already had the possibility to share content which definitely helps so you could of course sit down and just manually uh, schedule five ten tweets or whatever a day if you don't have any content you you want to set out you, you could use who uh, tweet to do that if you want it will require a bit more work so, so to speak um but but there's nothing wrong in building it it's, it's never too early to build an audience basically i guess is what i'm saying yeah it certainly seems like you could just tweet newsworthy things that come up from wired or io9 or kind of if you're for a fantasy sci-fi kind of audience to uh, get people interested in you know, there's nothing wrong with just being a curator of content. Uh, a lot of blogs oh, yeah, make sure. a lot of money <laughs> that way. Sure, yeah. Do you have any best practices for the pinned tweet that you talked about earlier? Like, I think I've got my book uh, picture in it and then like a book to read link so people can get it from uh, like five different platforms. What are you doing uh, with yours? Um, yeah, so of course the the picture that you're having there needs to be a really really good looking picture. I mean, I actually got a professional designer to do that one specifically for this um, because it, it has to be really well beautiful looking picture so that you actually people are actually wanting to to click and and see what it is. Uh, if it's just something you smack together yourself, uh, uh, unless you have skills in this sort of stuff, I, I would steer away from that and, and get something. Or if maybe if you have a friend who has uh, some uh, digital design uh, qualities or skills, then uh, make them do it for you. But um, try to make the picture look engaging and looking beautiful. Uh, and then uh, you need to, uh, the text itself should be, I actually on top of my head, I can't even remember exactly the text I'm using on mine, but uh, I guess people can just check uh, if they want to see that. But, uh, but, but it, you know, it, it has to be, something where you know if you if you're saying something about free that that's uh, some people people uh, most people like that if you're if you're using the word uh, exclusive people like that word too so it is try try to hit on some of those um uh, let's say words that you know that if you yourself was checking somebody's profile and you saw a pinned tweet what would you what it would entice you to click something um so usually if if it's exclusive uh, for example my behind the scene thing i'm only giving it away there on on that pin tweet it's not available anywhere else uh, so that's the only way to get to it uh, which makes it a, a bit more interesting for people to sign up for um, um but but to some extent this is this is of course to some extent a numbers game meaning that i'm i'm following 400 new people hoping that they will check my profile and some of them will click it so all i can do is try to optimize my chances that people will click it and find it interesting by using good pictures and good text um, 
but you have to as we as we talked about before you have to cycle through you know a number of people every day to keep the engagement there and to keep new people checking it because otherwise it's going to kind of peter out um so yeah it is yeah. part of numbers game now um let's say for example uh, like obviously this uh, anything on your profile is something that's going to mostly appeal to uh, new subscribers because new subscribers are usually the ones that are actually clicking on your profile. Let's say that you're somebody who doesn't have a lot of news out very often. Is there any value in still periodically like updating your your pinned tweet, uh, or uh, yeah, or or can it sort of remain stagnant until you actually have something new to share? Uh, it can certainly remain stagnant. I mean, um, I I think I updated mine like six months ago. Um, <clears throat> but other than that, I've ever only used two pin tweets. So the one I had before and then the one I have now. Uh, so I'm, I'm not trying to, or I would not advocate that you need to every whatever two months or month or whatever, uh, you need to update your pin tweet to something new. Uh, I mean, at the end of the day, the pin tweet is there for the new people. Um, the ones who are already following you, uh, they either already downloaded the pin tweet because they wanted it or they ignored it and they don't want it. <laughs> so, so it's e really only there for, for the new people who's coming in. Uh, so, um, so they can download it and, and as soon as they have downloaded it, they are on the email list. And then I have a whole different kind of communication going with people there anyway. So, yeah. Okay, my next question is a viewer question from Monty. He says, with reference to Twitter, has anyone had success with IFTT, the if this, then that, to keep Twitter synced with Twitter and uh, across social medias? I need that again. Well, okay, uh, he's asking about the if this, then that service, where we want to know if you are aware of anyone that uses Twitter and also use that to keep everything synced across all the social network platforms. No, I'm not aware, no. So that's a short answer. I'm not aware. Posting your tweets on Facebook, or I guess you, I I know we've talked about that app before, but I don't remember exactly what it does. But I feel like that might is might be the one where you tweet whatever you tweet also shows up in your Facebook feed. Right. Yeah. If this then that is a service that basically you say if I tweet then put it on Facebook or if I put something on Instagram tweet the picture. Like it, we actually use that to automatically put the Facebook post for this podcast. Right. So there we are. We're expert users of it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, I just will say that I find it, I kind of roll my eyes when I see that just because tweet, your, twit, twits, <laughs> tweet tweets are like, <laughs> I can't say them, are so short. You know exactly that's a Twitter thing right there. If you see it on Facebook, you're like, that's somebody posting their Twitter stuff. You know, I don't know. But only maybe only an author would even be watching that kind of thing. So it might work for, for readers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, the, of course. I mean, of course. If you are, well, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, if you put my system in place, you will have these twenty tweets going out every twenty-four hours, and um, I, I don't know. I don't know how other people use their face, uh, Facebook uh, feed there, but uh, I, I would probably get pretty annoyed if somebody's sending out twenty times a day in the Facebook feed. I, I don't know, but I would personally get a bit annoyed about that, but. Yeah, that it is different, different on platform. Facebook because I know yeah. I'll probably just do like maybe three things a week on my Facebook author page, and you'll see people continue to comment for like twenty four hours after. So it yeah, it's not it doesn't it's not as immediate there necessarily. No, no, I mean it, it's 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 a different platform, and there is different social rules, so to speak, on Facebook than on Twitter. Um, on Twitter, it is common practice to tweet quite often. Um, so if I was yeah, posting stuff on Facebook 20 times a day, I, I don't think that would be good. All right, just a few more questions left here. Um, so I'm curious, we haven't really talked about being retweeted or is there anything you do to try to be, other than just posting interesting content to try to get other people to retweet you? And cause that seems like a great way to be exposed to new possible fantasy readers or you know whatever your genre is and for them to see the profile page that we were just talking about yeah exactly that's true uh, when people start retweeting your stuff then uh, you are going to get much more exposure and that is good um, uh, i am actually uh, saying in 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 the book that um, i don't uh, 
I don't advise these uh, sort of things where, you know, you probably come across some of these tweets sometimes where people say, please retweet this or something like that. You know, I, I don't do that sort of thing. Um, if my content is not valuable enough that people want to retweet it, then either I need to go back and uh, to the drawing board and create better content, uh, or it could also be that I'm I'm interacting with the with a, a wrong audience. Uh, but um, uh, but you know if you go into the um, Twitter analytics uh, inside your Twitter account, you can actually uh, quite easily see how how many impressions you're getting a month, how many retweets, and uh, how many link clicks and um, when, uh, when I'm checking mine, I'm getting about half a million impressions per month, uh, with 570 retweets, 600 link, 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 link clicks. So, uh, and, and some of those will of course then end up on, on the uh, email list. Some of them will abandon when they click the link, like, like people do for some reason. I don't know, <laughs> but that's see something people do. Uh, so, so you are gonna get some traction here and at the end of the day of course again the more followers you have of course there are also going to be more likes there are going to be more retweets because there are more people um so so building up that platform of um of the uh, readers that is in your target audience is is vital if if you're going to be uh, you know a thousand followers in itself is great but it's it's not going to generate a ton of retweets you can easily imagine yeah, absolutely. Um, so one of the questions, a quick question is like, should a nonfiction author focus on different things than fiction authors do with their tweets? Or are most of your uh, your recommendations sort of genre agnostic? Um, I know of people who split it out. So I know of people who are running their their fiction stuff uh, on, a, on a separate account to their uh, nonfiction stuff. And there's certainly value in that. Um, it's it's probably if you can manage it's probably a good idea uh, because some of the the audience will be different uh, or your target audience will be different. But uh, personally, I don't do it. I have uh, both my nonfiction and my fiction stuff uh, on the same account. So of course, I understand that uh, my followers there will be uh, readers of fantasy among the followers, and then I'm all of a sudden tweeting about a Twitter for Authors book, uh, and that's not ideal. But but that's that's a that's a choice of mine because because I don't want to have to spend more than 30 minutes a day uh, managing Twitter. And if I'm setting up a separate one, all of a sudden I'm an, at, at an hour a day um, because and, and I don't want to do that. So so that's a personal preference. And I guess it comes down to how, how much time you have on your hands and how much time you want to spend. Um, but uh, I'm doing both and it, it's it's OK, you know, uh, but not all the tweets are relevant to everybody. Uh, that's, that's the downside. But I, I'm saving the time, though. <laughs> I have another or viewer question also from Monty. He asks, have you ever used the Tweet My Book Twitter promotion service offered online? No, I have not used that, no. Nice and quick. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Lindsay, over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is done with his questions. <laughs> well, I've got a couple more, but I can wait till the end here. All right. Well, my last one is just going to be, you've mentioned some of the services that you use. Could you just, uh, if there's, you know, maybe recap those or and if right. there's any other thing, anything else you're doing to help with the automation and just keeping it flowing? Yes, absolutely. So, um, so I, the, the, the types of software I'm mentioning inside the book is, uh, first of all, Canva. Canva is a free uh, tool where you can create pictures and stuff. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, so, so that one is good to, for creating some good pictures to go along with your tweets. Uh, then I use uh, Bitly, uh, which is the link uh, shortener, because uh, I can then track how many link clicks I'm getting, um, and also which links are getting clicked. So, so those two I use. So that's just things that kind of goes as an add-on together with the tweets. Uh, but other than that, then the stuff I've been mentioning here is a Crowdfire. So Crowdfire is uh, what I use to follow and unfollow people with, um, and it has some really really cool algorithms sitting behind the Crowdfire app so that it'll also automatically filter um, between those who uh, are most engaging. So once, for example, if I clicked on, on one of you guys, it will show me the most engaged Twitter users on the top of the list. So I'll start following those first. So it has all this kind of good stuff in, within built into the algorithm, as well as, as when you're unfollowing people. If you want to unfollow people, the list it'll generate will put the people on the top who basically have, it is the longest since you followed them and they have not followed you back. So that you're not gonna end up unfollowing somebody you just followed yesterday. 
if you see what I mean. So so that it, it's really good for that. So that's Crowdfire. Uh, then I use uh, Hootsuite, uh, which is the one that where I set up all these uh, columns of uh, different uh, things that are relevant that I want to look at every Saturday morning in my case. Um, then I use Socialumph, which is the this tool that will where you can fill up any number of queues that you want, and you can set uh, uh, how often each queue needs to tweet, uh, and then that will start posting automatically. So between those, you are well covered. All right, that's like I, I was I was writing those down as we went along. So there's definitely some good stuff for me to check out. Uh, you had said, and this is something that I subscribe to as well. Uh, that like when people reply to you, you should reply back to them, like just interacting with your audience. But two questions about that. First, let's say, you know, the best case scenario happens and you end up with so many followers that your, uh, your replies become very, very uh, active. Uh, should you still be trying to reply to each and every one of those people? <laughs> I I guess I will know once I cross that bridge. I mean, I have uh, forty thousand followers, and it's definitely manageable. Uh, I'm, I'm I'm as I said, I'm spending fifteen minutes a day. It is it is manageable, and for the far most part, people will retweet or like. And of course, that stuff you don't comment on. You just let them do that. Uh, I have seen some people always, every time somebody retweets, they'll send them a message saying, thank you for the retweet. Uh, you're going to kill yourself if you're going to try to do that. Uh, so don't bother with that. But uh, but the actual direct mentions that you're going to get is is manageable, at least to the 40,000 followers I have now. That That's perfectly manageable. But I guess I'll, I'll come back on this podcast once I have a million, and then I'll let you know. <laughs> Uh, the other thing is, occasionally, like just by the nature of a message you receive, uh, a reply isn't necessarily uh, called for. Like just liking somebody's reply is that sort of sufficient, or perhaps as a conversation under? Yeah, ex that's exactly what I, I'm saying in, in the book as well. You know, if, if if the conversation, if you kind of feel like, okay, you know, this is petered out now, there's no more value to be added in this conversation. Usually, you just end it with a like because then the person on the other end will see okay he saw my he saw it uh, but then it, it is it is a very good conversation and and um 99.9 percent .9 of the time people respect that uh so it's it's kind of an unsaid rule all right i have a couple more viewer questions for you and i think we can wrap this up first question is from Jin. have you heard of success with people using twitter to do flash fiction like serial tweets to tell a story uh, I have seen some of that, yes. Um, the, the, the thing you probably need to be mindful about in doing that is that, um, uh, you, of course, you need to put in like this is number one out of X uh, so that people understand that this is a serial thing going on. And I would also, if I was going to use it, I will also use. A, I would also select a very specific hashtag only for that so that if people want to see all those tweets, they would type in in the search field that's particular hashtag that you're using so that they will get everything uh, you know to show from the search all those tweets related to that so you need to pick something unique that is uh, as a hashtag that is only relevant to that stuff that you're doing there so you can do it uh, but um, you need to I, I would say you need to keep your expectations in check uh, most people won't actually go through the hassle of searching to see what was that and why, why what is this out one out of 15 i don't you know most people won't that's not how most people use twitter so um, if you keep your expectations in check uh, you can do it you can do it but it, it's, you you mean yeah. you do mean like one out of 15 thousand right because right. Short, <laughs> yeah. <right? laughs> well, yeah well uh, well i don't know you could try it out but uh uh, but it, it, it's I, I think it's going to be hard to, uh, to to actually gain traction with that. All right. And my last question is another viewer question. This one is from Sarah. Have things changed for you now that there is a longer character count? Well, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, actually, um, uh, when uh, uh, there's a funny story with that because when when Twitter announced that they were going to change the lo to the longer character count now, uh, there was uh, quite a lot of debate on Twitter itself, of course, as well whether or not this was a good thing or a bad thing. And uh, you know that uh, Twitter is equal 140 characters, so you can't change it. And you know how people usually react to changes. Nobody likes changes, right? Uh, so uh, <laughs> um, Twitter actually said at that point in time that they believed that once it had settled down, 
people would automatically more default to the 140 anyway, even though there's 280 available. Uh, and the stats that they came out with afterwards was actually that it looks like most people are defaulting to around 140, uh, unless you are having, you know, unless there is more substantial stuff that you need to say, then, then you will start now seeing tweets uh, that takes up more characters. Uh, but but far the most is still like short messaging interactions. Uh, so at least so far, I believe Twitter was right in their analysis here that uh, that people will, for the most part, keep to the short form communication. All righty. I think that is it for all our questions. Let me hand you back over to Lindsay and see if we can wrap this up for you. All right. I do have to say that the most money I ever got paid per word for a short story I sold was to a little you know e twitter magazine and they it had to be a short story in one tweet i right. got like a buck for 12 words <laughs> cool <laughs> so those are pro rates <laughs> but uh that, if you like haiku and that excites you you could try to play around and do some stuff with your characters and uh you know one or two tweets why not <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> All right. Well, that's about all the questions we have for you. Thank you so much for this is like the Twitter intensive <laughs> class. So all the questions people should have had should have been answered today. And can you remind us the names of your books and where people can find you online? Yeah, so um, my, my own books you will find at uh, jespersmith.com. So uh, that's S-C-H-M-I-D-T. Uh, uh, I don't know, maybe you need to put it in the show notes. Uh, since I'm not an uh, English native here, my name is sometimes difficult for people. But <laughs> uh, And then, of course, you can also find me on uh, amwritingfantasy.com, where I'm running that site together with another fantasy author as well. So so that's an, that's an option. Uh, on YouTube, you can just type in fane of fantasy in one word and my channel will pop up as well all right great and it's episode 159 for anyone that wants to stop by the show notes i will put the links to your books and your sites and also the social oomph and the tools that you mentioned so that if people want to check them out you know and and we're at marketing sff.com still <laughs> episode 159 and i will try to get everything in there and thank you so much and what was the name of the twitter book Twitter for authors. All right, that's easy. Go check yeah. it out, guys. <laughs> Thank you for coming on, and thanks, everyone, for listening. Nice to meet you, Jesper. Thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks a lot, guys. So long, everybody.